2 Chronicles chapter number 7. If you're, if you're there, would you say amen? amen? And it's page 496 in the Old Schofield Reference Bible. But I'm not going to expect you to remember this, but over the course of a couple Sunday nights that I've had the opportunity to preach on Sunday night, I've been looking at the subject of revival. And so I kind of want to just pick that up tonight and, and kind of uh, pick up where we left off. And so we looked at 2 Chronicles chapter number 7 and verse number 14 where it says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And so we've been looking at the subject of revival as we see it in this verse. You know, the very first word in that verse is a very powerful word just by a way of review very quickly tonight that is a grammatical supposition the word if and it's divinely placed by God we understand that we believe the scripture we believe all of the scriptures is inspired by the Holy Ghost would you say amen and so we believe that grammatical supposition, it expresses a condition, it expresses a hypothesis kind of like for instance if we say if it rains today the ground will get wet. So obviously there's a condition, and if that condition is met, this will happen. Well, that's what the writer of this book here is saying through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He says, if my people. So God's saying, hey, if my people such and such, then this will happen. We'll look at that here in just a little bit. Or we might say, if I drive my car to Florida... I will need to gas up the car to make the return trip. And so many times I think today we focus on all the reasons why we think we cannot have revival. Maybe you're like me. Maybe from time to time you, you hear preachers preach about revival and you think, is it really going to happen? I don't ever want to get to the point where I don't think that it can happen. I want to believe that I serve a God big enough that can still send revival to our nation, can still send revival to a church, and can still send revival to our families. Boy, we need revival. And so we talked about the condition of revival. The condition is the word if. I think today in the 21st century, because we've maybe never experienced revival on a national scale, we kind of have stopped expecting revival on a national scale. But, you know, I understand many, many decades have passed since the old Great Awakening of the 1700s and all that happened there, and even the revivals in the Old Testament. Sometimes we think, can it really happen today? But because of that fact, just because we have never lived in a time period when there has been a national revival, I still want to expect it. I still want God to, to, to bring revival can I put that down on the bottom shelf this evening? God has not changed. The same God that brought revival years ago is the same God that can bring revival even today and tonight to our land and to our church and to our family and to our marriages and to our own spiritual being. And so we talked about the condition of revival. Then we talked about the characters of revival. We looked at that little phrase, my people. Sometimes we think, well, there has to be revival. It has to happen to everybody outside of this auditorium. But God says, if my people, it's all going to start, revival is going to start with God's people. It begins with the people of God. And we looked at the genesis of response. We looked at the genesis of, or the um, genuineness of relationship. And we asked the question, do you know God? Are you saved tonight? And so we looked at the characters of revival. And you say, Brother Mark, what exactly is revival? Well, I put the, the definition of it. I know we've looked at this before, but revival is the visitation of God which brings life to Christians who have been sleeping. Now, how many would be honest tonight that maybe sometimes if we've been in it for any length of time, I see a few of you nodding your head. If we're not careful, we begin to sleep spiritually. And I hate to admit it, I've been there before. But revival is the visitation of God which brings life to Christians who have been sleeping and restores a deep sense of God's near presence and holiness. If we awake, we're going to realize and, think, and, and say, boy, God's presence 
is right there next to us. His holiness is so real. His holiness is way up there, and I'm way down here, and I need to get to that as much as I can. That's what revival is. Then look at the second part of that definition. Thence springs, so because of all that, because you, you realize you were sleeping, you awake, you realize God is near and He's holy, because of that springs a vivid sense of sin and a profound exercise of heart in repentance, praise, and love with an evangelistic outflow. That's what revival is. When we experience revival, man, all of a sudden we have a vivid sense of sin. Now sin is horrible. We don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, the Bible talks about fools make a mock at sin. If we have a profound sense and a vivid sense of sin, we don't even want to joke about sin. We don't want to joke about what the world will joke about. And then we have a profound exercise of heart in repentance. And we just say, Lord, I'm undone. I'm unclean. As the pastor said this morning, hey, we're not okay. We need your help in our life. And then we turn around and we begin to praise him for all that he's done. And then we begin to love him like we should. And then we want to tell others about him that's what revival is so we looked at the condition of revival we looked at the characters of revival and then we're, we looked at the caliber of revival very quickly by way of review the caliber or the makeup of it we looked at how pride is is going to hinder revival when we think more of ourselves than we should the bible says if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves so we looked at that pride and how it's a damaging pride we looked at how pride is a root sin starting way back with lucifer and then it's a ruinous sin boy pride can damage a family pride can damage a church pride can damage a nation i wonder if maybe that's why america's not being blessed like it once was because we've got lifted up and we think we don't need god in our life anymore we don't need god in our nation anymore and so pride can be so damaging pride is a root sin pride is a ruinous sin pride is a ridiculous sin think about it how ridiculous is it to be prideful to th because God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God determines how many heartbeats my heart is going to take. God determines how many breaths these lungs are going to breathe. He's in charge of it. It's a, pride is a ridiculous sin. But not only is it a ridiculous sin and it's, we, we need to have humility, but also it's a do-it-yourself project. The Bible says, shall humble themselves. We as Christians should humble ourselves. So we looked at the condition of revival. We looked at the characters of revival. We looked at the caliber of revival. And then tonight, I want to look at the, what I would call the calling of revival or the calling for revival. And I want to speak for a few minutes tonight on this topic, on the subject of prayer. And I think, and as Pastor Treber mentioned it a little bit, he alluded to it about prayer and how maybe so many of us don't pray like we should. And we can always do more. I'm cognizant of that fact. But prayer, what is prayer? I just jotted down a few things. We know we talk about prayer, but what exactly is it? Let me give you a few definitions. Prayer is tapping into heavenly resources. Prayer is saying, God, I need you to do something. I don't know how to do it. And I need you to work, but I'm going to try to tap into your heavenly resources because I want you to do something in my life. I want, I want you to do something so great and so big that I'd have to say it was God. That's what prayer is. How about this? Prayer is engaging God. And my, oh my, do we need God's engagement in our life. We need God's engagement in our churches. We need God's engagement in our nation. Prayer is engaging God. Boy, what's my father-in-law, he, sa he says this sometimes when he's preaching. He says, I want the big wheel to get mixed up with the little wheel. You know, that's a clever way of saying, hey, I'm little and I want God to help me. Hey, we need God to help us. We need God to, we, to, to be engaged in our lives. How about this? Prayer is connecting to the power source. Prayer is connecting to the power source. Boy, you ever try to work with an iron or an electric tool and don't plug it in? You ain't going to get very far. If we try to do this Christian life without tapping into the power source, 
It's all for naught. Hey, every special that's sung, every choir number that's sung, every message that is preached, every Sunday school lesson that is taught, boy, we should want to tap in to the heavenly resource. We should want God to be engaged. We should want the power source hooked up to our life. Prayer connects, I like this, prayer connects our nothingness to his almightiness. Boy, we're nothing. I'm nothing. But I want God to connect my nothingness to his almightiness. And when that happens, things can happen. Not for my glory, but for his glory. And so we see, the Bible says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, and what's the next two words? And pray. What's the next two words, everybody? And pray pray. And so we see the requirement to pray. The duty of prayer is what I'd call it. You know, God doesn't leave prayer as an option. It is an obligation. Luke 18, 1 says that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always. You know, prayer isn't everything, but everything needs prayer. Everything needs prayer. How many of us, maybe we are guilty from time to time, we wake up and we go about our day and we have not prayed and asked God to help us. Prayer isn't everything, but everything needs prayer. Boy, you try to raise a family for God's glory, you're going to need prayer. You trying to live for God yourself in this wicked, wicked world that just seems to be getting more and more wicked, you're going to need prayer. You're going to need the Bible. You're going to need prayer in your life. How about attempting to witness for him? Boy, you're going to need prayer. If nothing else, pray for boldness. But pray for liberty. Pray for clarity. Boy, you begin to engage with somebody and talk to them about the gospel. Boy, you don't know how that conversation is going to go. If nothing else, pray for wisdom. Say, Lord, would you help me as I try to talk to this person? Everything needs prayer. So we see the duty of prayer. Or how about this? The delight of prayer. The delight of prayer. You know, if we've truly arrived at the caliber of revival where we feel like, hey, we are nothing. We are just a kind of a zero with the rim knocked out. We're nothing. Hey, we're going to delight to pray. Why? Because we need God's help. We are humbling ourselves. If we come to a place where we, we, we have no reputation, we're not concerned about ourselves, and we realize, God, I don't really have any resources, and I have no rights, and it's all about you. Hey, we're going to desire, we're going to delight to go to God in prayer because we realize, hey, outside of him, what's the Bible say? Without him, we can do nothing. We can't do anything without him. When we come to that place, we're going to pray. The Bible says he sh- in Psalm 91 and verse 15, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. God says, hey, just call upon me. I want to answer you. Isaiah 58 and verse 9, that then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer. What needs do you have in your heart tonight? We all raised, pretty much all of us raised our hand tonight and said, well, I've got a need. I've got something in my heart. Can I ask you? Do you pray about it throughout the week? Do you wake up and ask God to to bless that need? You know, isn't it wonderful to know that God is always ready to hear? He's ready to listen. He doesn't keep office hours. He never gets you never get a business signal when you go to him in prayer. He it, it never goes to voicemail. Boy, you ever try to call somebody three or four times it just keeps going to voicemail? Boy, that's frustrating. There's no voicemail with God. He's just there, hey call upon me and I'll answer thee and I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The Bible says they just call upon him. You won't get an out of office reply. You ever send an email to somebody and within a second it comes back to you and you're like, man, they're on top of it. And then it goes on and says, I'm out of the office. Please check back with me or check my assistant so and so. And you're like, no, I wanted to talk to you. I needed to address you. Hey, we don't ever get that with God. Jesus Christ is the perfect model when it comes to prayer. 
You think about the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 1. We, we read of a very busy day in the life of Christ. And he, he, he starts off early with his disciples and then they travel some. And he gets to all kinds of different people and multiple questions came his way. And there were problems and there were needs. And towards the end of the day, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. He ends up healing um, Peter's mother-in-law. And because of all that, news spread that, hey, Jesus was around. And so even more people came to him the next day. And then Jesus, they just keep coming around him. There was a whole bunch of people. But listen to what, how Jesus handled it. He had a busy day. And can I say from time to time, we all get busy. Man, you got jobs. You got church obligations. You got uh, ministries at the church. You got your family obligations. And you just feel like you're juggling all this. Jesus was so busy. But look at Mark 1. You don't have to turn there. Mark 1 and verse 35. It says, and in... The morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Jesus said, boy, I'm going to get up early. I know the the day is going to be upon me. And he went out and prayed. You know, here was God. He was, Jesus was in the flesh. Jesus was in the flesh as God. And yet he was finding time to commune with God. You and I, we can get very, very busy. We can even get busy in good things. But can I encourage you? Discipline yourself to take time to pray. Mark Leone, take time to pray. Take time to talk to God. Not, not to do it before so other people will see us. Not to do it so anyone will notice. But, and not to do it to get any kind of applause. But just to pray. What's the Bible say in Matthew 6 and verse 6? But thou... When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. You know what the Lord Jesus is saying? Hey, go find you a spot where no one's going to be able to know. Do it in the privacy of your own heart, privacy of your, your, yourself, and pray to God. So we see the delight of prayer. We see the discipline of prayer. Boy, let's be disciplined about that. Prayer is the weight room of the Christian life. Prayer is the weight room of the Christian life. Maybe you're here tonight and you ran a bus route today and maybe you're tired or maybe you ushered or maybe you sang a special or maybe you're, you sang in the choir or maybe you preached on the other side of the building tonight or yesterday, uh, this morning and, and man, you just, you're worn out. But you know what? That's good. But all the prep work is even more important. You know, they, they say with high school students, boy, it's a big thing to play Friday night football under the lights. But you know all those football players, what do they do? They go to the gym, and they work out, and they get ready, and they try to build their muscle mass, and they do the leg presses, and they do the bench presses and all that. What are they doing? They're training for game day. That's how we should be as Christians. We should be in the, the weight room called our prayer life because prayer is the weight room of the Christian life. You know, everybody wants to be under the lights but it's only going to do us well. We only will be effective if we spent time walking with God. We're only going to be effective. We're only going to be able to teach those children or preach to those teenagers or preach to the adults or whoever if we have spent time praying to our Heavenly Father. That's where it all matters. How about this? So we see uh, the delight of prayer. We see the duty of prayer. We see the discipline of prayer. How about this? We see the direction of prayer. You know, it's, impo- it's possible to forget that when we pray publicly, we're not praying to each other. That's right. You know, when we pray publicly, yes, it's for everyone to hear it, but more importantly, we're not praying this way. We're praying that way. That's you ever heard a, a, maybe a child pray or maybe a new, new Christian pray? They don't know all the fancy lingo. They don't know the thous and the these and the Lord, would you look down from heaven on high? And they're just praying out of their heart. Sometimes we get wrapped up in the these and thous when we should just realize that we are praying to God Almighty. And let's say you're invited to come up here and pray. Man, just realize, hey, I'm really just praying for the audience of one and to the audience of one. We're not praying to six, seven, eight hundred people. We're praying to God. You know, the direction of prayer. Boy, let's realize the direction of prayer. You know, we open up in prayer at our at our church. We're not doing that for 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 each other. We're asking God to meet with us. We want every service to have God in it. We want the Holy Spirit to walk up and down the aisles and move among our hearts. 
not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in, in time of need. You know, we don't have to use all the fancy words to pray. Of course, we should be reverent. We should be respectful. But we don't have to say God 20 times during a prayer. You know, have you ever listened to somebody and they'll say God about every three words? I'm thinking to myself, God didn't forget who he is, you know. You don't have to keep saying his name. And I understand some of that might be out of nervousness or not. But when I talk to Jonathan as our youth pastor, and I might say, Brother Jonathan, and two seconds later, I'm not Brother Jonathan. Hey, Brother Jonathan, Brother jo you know. We don't have to use vain repetition. The Bible talks about that. But, but God enjoys just hearing us talk to him. God just wants to open up our hearts and say, just pour it out to me. I want to hear you speak to me. Kind of like hearing a child pray. Boy, I love hearing children pray. They're so open. They're so honest. Help us to be that way. You know, sometimes we pray, Lord, bless this, bless that, bless, bless. And I think to myself, Mark, you said bless 15 times, you know. What exactly are you meaning? I've tried to focus in on that. So we see the duty of prayer. We see the delight of prayer. We see the discipline of prayer. We see the direction of prayer. How about this? The desire of prayer. The Bible says in 1 John 5 and verse 14, this is the confidence that we have him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So it sounds to me we need to pray according to his will. I wrote down, our desire should be his desire. Uh, my desire should be what God desires. My goal should be God's goals. You know, I shouldn't come to him and pray and say, Lord, I this, I that. But like Jesus prayed, not my will, but thine be done. That's how we should come to him, the desire of our prayer. You know, sometimes we get so frustrated because God doesn't answer our prayer I wonder if when we get to heaven, God's going to just kind of roll back the curtain and say, I didn't answer your prayer because of this reason. And we think, man, I'm glad you didn't answer my prayer. And so we should pray according to his desire. So we see the requirement to pray. And then lastly, and we'll close here in just a few minutes, the rigor in pursuit or a rigorous pursuit. The Bible says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, read the next four words with me if you would, and seek my face. And seek my face. When we go to God, are we seeking his voice? Are we seeking his face? I wrote down this. Listen to the decree of God's voice. Listen to the decree of God's voice. You ever look at your child, if, you have a, if you're a parent in here, and you're, you're talking to your child, and maybe you can tell they're just kind of off in space in their mind, they're, they're, their mind's out in left field, and you go, son, son, look at me, look at me. What are you trying to do? You're trying to get their attention. You want them to be focused in on you. Why? Because you want them to obey. You want them to be zeroed in. You want them to be locked in. You want them to be laser focused on on you, maybe because you're telling them, hey, you know, when you go do this, I want you to do this, and really it's for their safety. It's for their sake. I wonder if God up in heaven, he's going to, to Mark, and he's saying, Mark Leone, look at me. Look at me. And we're not looking at his face. We're not, we're not given a whole lot of attention. Well, like I said, we can get so busy. Often we're told in the Bible to seek the Lord. Isaiah 55, verse number 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. The Bible tells us here in this verse to seek his face. You know, we live in a society where there's not a lot of FaceTime. I know there's the app called FaceTime and all that, but, but maybe you have an employer and your direct report is in another state. Or maybe you're a manager and you have employees spread throughout the United States. Or maybe, maybe uh, uh, you just communicate with people a lot by text message or email. There's not a lot of FaceTime. Zoom helps, but nothing beats the face-to-face -face meetings. You know, there's so much that can be communicated through body language and through facial expression and tone of voice. And we, we learn to read others. But you know, most of all, we need to, to learn the mind of God. We need to learn his heart in the matter. You ever come to a situation, you say, I don't know what to do. 
Just pray and ask God, I don't know what to do, but I want to do your will. I want to know your heartbeat in the matter. Maybe you have a child rearing issue. Maybe you have a, a life's calling issue and you're not, which, you're not sure which way to go. Listen to God's voice. Can I ask you tonight, are you and I listening to God? Do you hear what he is saying to you? I like this phrase, and I heard this years ago. In fact, I heard it from Pastor Trevor. He says this, obey every spiritual impulse. Now, that is easier said than done. I realize that. But how many times have you been somewhere where you've had a thought cross your mind, and you knew it was the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and you just pushed the voice aside? Can I encourage you to obey every spiritual impulse? Maybe you're at the gas station, you have a track in your, on your dash, and, and you're, you strike up a conversation with somebody getting gas, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, why don't you give them the track? And you go, you think, but what are they going to say? What are they going to think? Obey every spiritual import, impulse. Listen to God's voice. Then I said, then I wrote down, look in the direction of God's eyes. As you pray, seek his face. Sometimes we're afraid to look into God's face because, man, we know that maybe God's looking where we don't really want him to look. Maybe he knows something about us, and he does, that we don't want straightened out. And so we're, we're man, you ever, maybe as a kid, you messed up and you're scared to look at your parents' face? You think, man... You know, for instance, we had a child one time do something that they shouldn't have done, and you could tell he did not want to look parent, his parent in his eyes. Man, we've been there before. But look at, in the direction of God's eyes. Where is God looking tonight? Maybe he's tapping you on your shoulder and says, hey, this needs attention in your life. This area isn't right, or this needs to change. Hey, can I encourage you, Second Chronicles 7, 14? Pray. And seek his face. Seek his face. Where's God looking? You know, you think about the disciples. Even the disciples, man, they, sometimes they got off track. They came to the Lord and say, Lord, who's going to be on the right hand when we get to the kingdom? They were all concerned about who was going to be number one. And, God's, and the Lord Jesus Christ said, hey, don't worry about that. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ was doing? He was saying, hey, just look at me. Don't be concerned about all these peripherals. You know what? It reminds me of a verse in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hey, dear Christian, can I encourage you? Look unto Jesus. Boy, don't get wrapped up into all these peripherals, all these side things. Boy, just look to Jesus. And then lastly, live for the display of God's smile. You know, the presence of a smile communicates a lot. You know, the absence of a smile communicates a lot. Can I ask you tonight, do we know what, do you and I know what makes God smile? Do we know what brings joy to the Lord? Do we know what brings a frown to our Lord? I'd venture to say on a Sunday night, probably all of us would know what brings a frown to the Lord. Probably all of us would know what brings a smile to God. I think of that verse in 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Boy, all of us parents can identify with it. Boy, we love to see our kids doing well. I saw Brother Greg Hyatt shaking his head, or either that or he was yawning. I'm not sure, but, uh, but he was shaking his head, I think. And boy, his kids seem to be doing well. Man, man, you get excited about seeing your kids do well. Jesus says, hey, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. How about this? Jesus said in John 8, 29, I do always the things that please him. Boy, it sounds like Jesus' goal was to make God happy. Jesus Christ never lived one single day for himself. He always did that which pleased the Father. How many of us here tonight would, would, uh, could live one whole day and say, boy, I pleased God that entire day? You know, is there anything in our life tonight that would make God unhappy? You know, one of the things, and I'll close with this illustration one of the things that's kind of a joy about marriage is just talking about maybe your, your childhood. And, I, of course, I've talked with my wife about our child, my childhood, and I've talked to my kids about my childhood. And you say, Brother Mark, were you a perfect kid or a perfect teenager? No, far from it. Did you do bonehead things? Yes, I did bonehead things. 
But for the most part, I stayed out of what I would call the big trouble. You know, I didn't, the Lord spared me from several things. I'm thankful for it. But my wife, as I talk with her about that, she's interested because, you know, she grew up in a Christian home. I had a Christian dad, but my parents split up. And she's kind of, I don't know, enthralled or maybe surprised that maybe a kid in from that type of situation might quote unquote turn out and she'd always she's asked me several times she said mark what what was it i mean why you you weren't given near as much as i had what 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 was the factor you say well brother mark was it that you were spiritual the truth of the matter is i tried to be spiritual but i don't know that i was the most spiritual person in our youth group was it that you read your Bible every day? I tried to read my Bible. I tried to pray, but I can't say I did read my Bible every day. You say, well, what was it, Brother Mark? And as I look back, probably the biggest factor was, you know, I just wanted to not disappoint my dad. I didn't want him to feel like, Mark, you let me down. And that stayed in my mind when temptation came my way the truth was I didn't want to disappoint my dad. I didn't want him to I didn't want to face him knowing that I let him down that I grieved him. Now, as preacher says, come up close. Spiritually speaking, do you live like that where you say I don't want to grieve my heavenly Father? Boy, if we'll live like that. If we'll live like that during the week and say, "Man, I don't want to look my heavenly father in the eyes and know that I did such and such. I don't want to disappoint him. Boy, that will change our life. The Bible says, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. if we'll humble ourselves and pray and seek his face, the requirement to pray, and then we see the rigorous pursuit. Let's seek his face. Let's, let's listen to God's voice. Let's look at his eyes. Let's uh, desire to see him smile upon our face. Boy, if we'll do that, we, I'll say we'll be a successful Christian. If we'll pray, we'll seek his face and live for God. And so we see here the calling of revival. Boy, this is a step towards revival. Hey, do you want revival? Maybe you're here tonight and you have something going on in your home and you say, Lord, I need you to revive this. I need you. I need your help. I need to be connected to the power. I need you to be engaged Go to God in prayer. What is it tonight that God has laid on your heart? You say, boy, I need to make it a matter of prayer. Boy, sometimes we neglect the hardest thing. You know, prayer is hard work. Sometimes we can neglect that. Let's pray. Let's be a praying people. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed tonight.